Uh, our contributions are as follows. Uh, we character and formulate the intercept interference in flash memories. Next, we propose constraint coding schemes for ICI indication. And we show some examples of the capacity and codes for breads first and even of ICI channels. So, that's good stuff. Flash memory is a widely used and volatile solid state memory device. Still all surely familiar. The concept of it is consists of storing charge in a floating gate layer surrounded by the electrons. The store data is the amount of charge in floating gates. The amount of charge determines the voltage threshold of the cell, the VT, the minimum gate voltage that causes the transistor to conduct. The observed VT is inaccurate due to cell programming, overshooting, um, various factors, many factors. Uh, a major factor is the interference from other cells. It's responsible for more than 30% of the distribution width and growing. And as a result, we must allocate a VT range for each stored value of the flash memory cell. Note that distribution width is actually the factor that determines the number of bits we can store per cell. The floating gate to floating gate intercell coupling, often referred to as intercell interference, causes the charge in one cell to affect the neighboring cell's special voltage. When considering each, each cell in isolation, the observed phenomenon is a widening of the special voltage distributions. Here in this example, you can see why it's multiplied by up to 4x. Uh, there has been an experiment to model the intercell interference with one for both by Lee et al. And we can see this formula that states the voltage of a certain cell dependent on the charge on the voltage actually stored in the neighboring cell and the coupling between them. So let's review some insights so far. The common programming algorithm in flash memories uses program and verify, where charge is added to a cell in small increments. The VT is checked after each addition, and programming seizes upon reaching the desired VT. Therefore, the VD of any given cell is affected only by the charge added to its neighbors after its own charging has been completed. And we see the effect of the intercell interference depends on the coupling, the data, and the programming scheme. Uh, let's take one minute to think and, and observe that we can't control on the coupling, it's, it's controlled mainly to manufacturing causes and the programming scheme is predetermined. We can't control it. We can in some cases. But we can control the data in information theory. So how can we handle this intercell interference? Uh, we looked up for related work in this subject. And uh, unfortunately, we, we found no academy addressing it, but there's tons of people addressed it in the industry and wrote patents about it. Uh, two major directions are considered. The first one is the proportional programming, which uses concurrent proportional programming of the same row cells to near simultaneous completion. And the other one is the intelligent decoding, which is based on the programming order it decodes with successive interference cancellation. Our approach is to use constraint coding. We forbid certain adjacent cell level combinations, and the return depends on the programming order. The threshold of this constraint is a design threshold. 
during program we use only permissible combinations, bigger code words, and during the coding we use the inverse mapping. We limit the effect of inter-cell coupling and narrow the distributions so we can have many levels. Uh, we use fairly simple encoding and decoding, and we only need to know an up or down bound uh, coupling coefficients. However, the code weight is below one. You can see the trade-off that on the one hand we make the distributions narrower, but on the other hand we add redundancy. So there might be an optimal point when we are when we where we reach in maximum capacity. It can be combined with ECC, and it, it can be complementary to the previous schemes and can be combined with it. Uh, we can use semi accurate programming and minimal restrictions, or we can use some restrictions with simpler intelligent physical. So the synopsis of our scheme consists of three steps. <coughs> On the first step, we assign ICI severity function, which we refer to as DC, to a data sequence that is to be programmed to the memory. And the severity function is depends on the programming order. On the order we program the, the data to the flash. On the second step, we choose T to restrict this severity function and determine the code rate. And last, we construct encoder and decoder modes. <coughs> so let's see the severity function. If we have a one-dimensional break-first coding in which a single row of cells is considered, as programming is done as follows. First, all the cells that have to be programmed to a level higher than zero are programmed to level one. Second, all the, level, all the cells which are to be programmed to a level higher than one are programmed to level two, and so on. This is a common programming algorithm in many flash devices. The second eligibility criterion is the sum of maximized difference between the neighbor cell and our cell and zero. We will shortly see an example of demonstrating this criterion. We want to restrict, to constrain this criterion with the value t, and t represents a trade-off. Large t is efficient coding, but wider distributions and fewer loads, and small t, opposite pros and cons. So let's see a demonstration of the thread first programming order to realize why this characterized the intercell interference. Uh, we address flash memory with four levels, zero to three. And we want to program three cells with the value of three enable cells with the value of three, two, and one. So at first, we give a program pulse, program pulse which consists of this charge injection and the intercell interference. Then we do verify. Observe that verify actually account for this intercell, additional intercell interference that had been added. We give another program pulse, and we see charge injection and another intercell interference, and then I'll ver verify. You can observe at that point that the intercell interference overshoots the level of the cell, in which this cell is read as one, a lot higher than one, a bit higher than one, because of the intercell interference. And the other two interference is accounted for the level of the cell. We give another program pulse, and by now, the right-handed cell facing post-programming into cell interference. We do verify, and by this time, the centered cell has reached its program that we meant to program to, level two, and we keep on programming the left-hand cell to level three, and we give another pulse, and now we see that the center cell is also facing the intercell interference after it's been completed and after it was verified. And the left-handed cell didn't still reach level three, so we give another program pulse, and oops, the center cell passed level three, 
and we can see that the synthesized RNAs do to this into cell coupling. Mm -hmm. And this, if we want to assign the severity function for this sequence of 3 to 1, is the maximum of the left minus the center at 0. And in this case, it's 1. It's 3 minus 2, which is 1. And the other one, we take the 0. The next step is to determine V and code rates. So let's for, take, for example, a flash cell with two levels, LCLC. And we want to restrict DC to be smaller than 2. Uh, DC equal to 2 can be reached by programming a data consists of 1, 0, 1. And we want to restrict this combination. So we have here the corresponding language graph and adjacent matrix. And we calculate the capacity of this uh, language, and it's 0 0.8115. And we want to construct the encoder and decoder as close to this capacity. Let's choose the code rate to be 0 0.8, in which we input four cells, uh, four values, except, excuse me, and output five values. So the encoder gets uncoded four bits input and encoded five bits output. And the decoder is vice versa. Next, we construct encoder and decoder. So first we raise the graph to the power of 5 and we use the state splitting algorithm. I won't go through all of it because of time constraints. And this is our final state machine uh, which actually implements the constraint of 2 to the intersign interference that was, that was presented. Uh, the edges are actually written here edges of the graph. And we can also observe that uh, using encoder and decoder as a state machine result may result in error propagation. So we can pay a rate penalty and reduce the rate by encoding with a lookup table. For example, we can have a rate of 0 0.652 and it's error propagation 3 since we have only one state, actually. If we want to generalize our scheme and by telling us we have a cell with L levels and we want to constrain it by T, we can build, we've been able to build a generalized constrained language web in which you only need to put L and T in the right directions, in the right values, you will get a constraint language graph. Uh, those are the, ingredi the ingredients of, uh, of the graph in terms of edges and nodes. And there's an additional edges if the labels are unique to the nodes. Uh, let's take another example by looking at even odd programming order, in which we consider uh, one dimensional single row of cells. And that even cells are programmed first and odd cells are second. And we can look at this uh, intercell severity function, the sequence eligibility criterion, in which the DC of odd cells is zero because they're programmed the latest, so there's no neighbor cells affecting them. But the even cells are being affected by the levels of both the right and the left cells. And we've been able to construct also a generalized constraint language graph that constraints this, uh, that limits this intercell interference phenomena uh, in the following way. Note that the graph presented so far are Shannon covers, and we have a proof in the paper, uh, first in the ICP paper, and next in the future paper as well as some other lemons and stuff. We've also been able to calculate some capacity results. Uh, we've been able to normalize the capacity with the number of levels per cell, so that maximum capacity would be one. And we can observe this in various cells 
various cell levels, between four levels per cell to 16 levels per cell, and calculate the capacity as a rate of the amount of constrained T divided by the number of levels L. And we can see that uh, code rates are fairly high, about 0 0.9 and above, and we can also observe that moving to higher levels per cell results in higher capacity. Uh, let's take another example. For t equals 5 and bread first programming with uh, l equals 4, we have a code rate, we've been able to build a code rate of 0 0.95. And uh, we've been able to narrow these distributions so that the number of levels per cell can be incremented from 4 to 5. So our baseline was uncoded information stored on node to the base 2 of 4, meaning 2 bits per cell. And the use of constraint coding, with the use of constraint coding, we use a code rate of 0 0.95 with the number of levels per cell increased from 4 to 5, and we've been able to store 2.2 .2 cells per cell, which is a 10% increase in capacity, and we can use this uh, in the same manner to increase the capacity or to, to, to uh, improve the reliability of flash memory cells. So uh, for conclusions, constraint coding can be used to chop off the tail of VT distributions with only a minor, a minor reduction in rate. It can be used beneficially to increase capacity or to increase reliability, and it can replace proportional programming and intelligent decoding or complement them. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, you claim advantages of this team. I'm missing a parameter of the memory itself that is hidden in how you get from 4 to 5. In the last, how do we get from 4 to 5 levels? Yeah, there's the missing parameter of the device. Right. So here. actually, it's not a missing parameter. Huh? It's uh, okay. Let's have a look in this uh, in this graph showing on the vertical axis the VT of the cells and on the horizontal axis the probability of programming a level to such a VT. So this is a log scale. So, so, so actually this one is uh, tails going one way or another. And if you chop off this tail, you make the distribution narrower. Now you actually you ask how narrow? How narrow? So the the amount of making this distribution error is, uh, you can assume it is linearly dependent with uh, the DC value. So if your intercell interference function is, has the values from uh, 0 to 5, so you can claim that each of these values is responsible for uh, some percent of the distribution bias according to its DC. So if you chop off, if you restrict the data programming to the flash to be, uh, to have to, to, so it won't have such that it won't have the intercell severity function uh, equals 5, for example, then you chop off uh, a certain amount of the distribution wise and so all the distributions become narrower. And if you have a constant safety margin, you can calculate the, this uh, amount of window, amount of voltage window gain, and you can see if you can stack in yeah, more distributions. The, the hidden component is the width of the distribution that has nothing to do with intercell interference, just because of some variability. The rest of the width is simply the probability, looking at the distance function, that what fraction of intercell level combinations 
would account for pool of a certain size. So that you can calculate given the function very easily. The only hidden portion is the base which below which you cannot. And here we took data available sort of and estimated conservatively from that. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again.